Welcome to this week's edition of the Pete Mazzetti Show. I'm Pete Mazzetti. My guest this evening is Commissioner Mark Boughton. Commissioner Boughton, welcome, my friend. How are you, pal? I'm great, Pete. It's great to, to be here. Uh, I know. Nice drive tonight oh, to you. come on up to the show. And, uh, um, just love this part of the state, so it's, well, it's awesome to be here. What's going on? It's been a while since we've seen each other. Yeah, we're working hard. As you know, we had, we had talked last time. I have really two pieces of, of my portfolio in state government. One is revenue tax collections, and yep. I'm the state tax commissioner or commissioner of the Department of, of revenue, revenue Services. Services. Right. And then the other piece is I'm Governor Lamont's senior advisor on infrastructure in the state. So I have the responsibility of implementing the six to seven billion dollar. Uh, bipartisan infrastructure law that passed uh, November of 2021. So I'm busy. Yeah. I'm like either driving around the state looking at bridges, roads, projects, <laughs> or I'm collecting your taxes. So I'm sorry, folks, but it's part of the job. That's it. <laughs> that, that's it. Now tell us a little bit about each of the port, the portions sure. of your job. Yeah, so we collect about $22 billion in taxes each year, okay. over 40 different tax types. We have a staff of about 600. Um, I lead a really able, competent, awesome uh, senior team mm -hmm. of people. Um, we spent a lot of time uh, looking at implementing what is happening in the legislature right now as this airs, which is the right. final days of the, le of the legislature and, and what bills pass and how that impacts our, our tax scheme for Connecticut. This okay. year we're lucky because okay. we get to cut the income tax for next year. Um, so we're going to see a, a half percent reduction in the uh, from 5% to 4.5% in the middle bracket, which will impact a lot of people. Right. Um, save some people some, some money there. We're going to give some money more schools. It's a good, solid budget. I think you're going to see a broad bipartisan support of the budget. Okay. Which is good. Right. Good to see people working together. Yeah. Um, and so in addition to that, um, we also spend some time working on policy with our partners at the Office of Policy Management. Sure. Who do a phenomenal job. OPM. Absolutely. Uh, they're the, the governor's budget office and report to the governor. And of course, I, I report directly to the governor um, on a daily basis about a variety of things. So that's my tax job. Okay. Um, but it's very complicated. It, it's reflected in Title 12 of our Connecticut General Statutes. Pete, don't go and read it because you're going to fall asleep. If you're watching this, you will fall asleep. It's count on me and our team to interpret what the heck that thing's saying. So I'm sure um, you've read it. Uh, I haven't read the whole thing, but I've been through a lot of it. And uh, when I need to take a nap, it's always a good fodder for that. There you go. Um, but, you know, we, we, it's pretty interesting. I don't think people know how much we do. So we have, in our team, we have people that, by the way, we're looking for help. So if you want to come work for the state, go on our website at drs.gov. Yeah. And we'd love to, love to hire you if you have the right skills, ct.gov. We have the uh, uh, skill set. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, um, we have a full call center that's located right in Hartford. Okay. Um, and I actually go down and I answer calls sometimes for an hour or so. And I, I help people with their tax problems. And if I can't get the answer right then and there, I call them back. Really? Um, and, and I do that because we ask every uh, new person coming into DRS, they're required to answer the phone and answer tax questions from our residents. Um, so I, if I ask them to do that, then I'm going to do it myself. Absolutely. And so I like the team to see me doing that. And I kind of have fun at it. You know? So it's a good time. But we, you know, we, do, we do things like that. We also do enforcement. Okay. Um, uh, the former chief of the Hamden Police Department works for us, Chief Sullivan. Excellent really? gentleman. Yep. Okay. And I have an enforcement team of about, I'm funded for 20. I've got about 11. Okay. And we're going to open up a window for hiring again probably in the late fall uh, where we're going to fill out that group. And so we go out, we do things like look for cigarette, those labels on the cigarette tax to make sure that they're taxed in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, we do some marijuana, uh, cannabis enforcement now. Okay. Um, and we're doing uh, a whole bunch of other things as it relates to investigations, domicile cases we call them. That's where somebody's claiming that they're not a resident of Connecticut, but... You know, we want to make sure that they're, especially if there's a lot of money on the table. So right. those people that are, you know, oh, could have a multi-million dollar liability to us, they have to prove that they're not residents by showing us that they spent six months and one day mm -hmm. somewhere besides the state of Connecticut. Right. So um, we have a whole team that does that. Uh, we have audits that are ongoing. You know, we're auditing businesses, we're auditing individuals. Um, that's always interesting. And we have a legal staff that's in court enforcing our uh, statutes and making sure people pay their bills. So it's, it's a big responsibility, a lot of responsibility. Uh, it's interesting because I'm the only person in state, well, I don't know if it's true with state government, but certainly one of the only commissioners that has to sign a non-disclosure agreement uh, with the IRS 
saying that I'm not going to look up Pete Mazzetti's taxes. Right. So the only way I can do that is, a, is for business purposes. Let's right. say you're being audited. Yes. I can then go in and look at it. But I can't for fun yeah. go in and say, let's see what, uh, you know, Johnny Jones makes down there in uh, Newtown, Connecticut. Right. And look exactly. Johnny Jones up and then go out and tell everybody what he makes. Yeah, you can't, can't do that. that. No. That would be a violation of state statute. Exactly. So that's the tax side. And on the um, infrastructure side, um, that has kept me hopping. I travel a lot. Sometimes out of state. I'm out okay. of the state about once a, a month. Um, Washington, D.C., I've been there probably 20 times now since they've imp implemented this law, you know, working with our, our congressional delegation. Right. People like Joe Courtney, Absolutely. phenomenal. Oh, great. Guy. Um, and also working uh, with our stakeholders here, our mayors. Our, we were just talking about Carl Fortuna yeah. before I came on, a great Absolutely. guy. Um, so, you know, we work on those localized projects that are eligible for federal funding. And my job is to help put everybody together. Make sure everybody's talking and working together mm -hmm. and make sure things get done. Now, here's the great thing about that job. Yes. The blessing is we have a terrific DOT led by Garrett Ucoleto, who, who took over for Joe yeah, Gilletti. Uh, Gilletti. Yep, sure. who you've had on the show. Absolutely. Garrett is awesome. I haven't had Garrett on you yet. you got to have him on. And okay. uh, I'll mention to, to him when I go back. We work great together. Okay. His staff, his team is wonderful. Uh, we also work with uh, Katie Dykes, who's the Commissioner of the Department of Energy mm -hmm. and Environmental Absolutely. Protection. Absolutely. So uh, Commissioner Dykes is terrific. And uh, uh, Commissioner Juthani from the Department of Public Health, we work with her as well, and she's terrific. So everybody talks, everybody works together. The directive goes from the governor, goes to me, out to the agencies, and then we work there. So I don't, I don't run DOT. I don't tell them what to do. I don't no. pick projects that get done. <laughs> no. I'm a force multiplier for them. Yeah. Garrett will handle me a problem and say, you know, go figure this out. Yeah. Or go to Washington and talk to this person or that person. Or I need X. Yeah. That's what I do in, in that role. And it's a really fun. And mayors all the time. I've been probably to almost over half of the cities and towns of Connecticut now looking at projects and meeting with local elected officials and state reps right. and state senators um, to, let, to make sure everybody's in the loop and knows what the heck it is we're doing. Now as far as local state people, you mentioned Garrett, you mentioned Commissioner Dykes. The other one we got to mention who you probably work with is another mutual friend of ours. Who's that? CCM. Oh, my man, Joe DeLong. Because if we don't mention him, we're both going to get in trouble. Yeah, yeah. Joe, uh, Joe and I go, yeah, yeah. I, oh. I actually was his first president when he came in from West Virginia. We got along great. Um, you know, he has. He's a great guy. He is a great guy. And he knew Connecticut. He, he was smart. He did a lot of research on Connecticut before he got here. Oh, yeah. But once he got here, he really embedded himself in our state. Mm. He knows Connecticut as well as anybody. Yeah. Uh, I talk to him on the off-session time about various things that cities and towns are concerned with. I try to, as a former mayor, you know, I was mayor for Danbury in 20, for, for 20 years. In yes, Danbury. you were. Um, so I bring that message of, of local elected office to uh, the governor, who's great at listening to stuff and are trying, wanting to understand what, what our challenges were mm -hmm. in that role. And, and so I kind of helped Joe and, and, and break down some barriers for him and try to get him in the room or at least get his, his concern heard because yeah. he's representing Almost, I think they have all, maybe 168 cities 160, and towns. 160. They're close. 168. Yeah, they, they're one short. I can't remember what it is. And I, don't, I know yeah. what it is, but I don't remember. Yeah, it. yeah. Because he's so, mentioned it. That's a great organization. And, um, you know, I, was, uh, I actually rose up to the ranks to be president of that organization. And uh, they do good things for Connecticut. They make the legislature think about the way right. it impacts a local town or a city. You know, we, we are lucky we have people like Kathy Osten who served as a first selectman. So yes. she, she knows that, she gets it, she, she's a chair of a probes. But yep. not everybody's had that dual, and we have some other people that have that dual experience. Right. Um, and, and some of them are still serving in that capacity. So they may not, the other, but other people, you know, they get elected and they just don't understand what mayors go through and trying to make everything work and uh, everything, uh, everything run on time. And I'm sure you do as both former mayor and now what you're doing now as commissioner. Yeah, I do. So, I mean, in terms of tax collection, too, it's been very helpful because a lot of the mayors have called with sort of localized issues that they just need some advice or some counsel or some help on. Not for the personal taxes, but maybe no. a constituent exactly. has a problem. Or, uh, you know, we sometimes will collect ta various different kinds of taxes. So the marijuana tax, right. for example, comes to us. We then figure out how much was sold in that town, and then we send a check out to that town that hosts the the uh, uh, yep. store that sells the uh, material. So, um, but they do come all the time and ask for, for thoughts and concerns and ideas. So it's great working with them. And um, I'm always good at uh, throwing out a little tidbit. You know what I would do if I were you, that kind of thing. Exactly. I can't help myself. So no, of course I not. Do that, but I don't. No, I'm, I'm sure as far as 
taxing cannabis, it's probably a lot different than taxing something something else that is non-cannabis -can related. Yeah, so we have a three-step uh, tax policy. There's a local municipal tax, I think it's 3%, and then there's an excise tax, and there's another tax um, that's derived out of it. I think, um, you know, we'll have, we're still in sort of beta. Yep. It's the first year of it, we're watching it roll out. I think, we're, we're, you know, it's just my own opinion, it's not the administration's opinion, nor is it the legislature. We may have taxed it a little bit too much. Okay. And I, the legislature may want to revisit that in the future because, it, first of all, it's not the cash windfall everybody thinks it is. No. I think we generated about the first month less, about a million dollars in taxes. So if you extrapolate that over 12 months, it's only $12 million. Right. I know it's a lot of money, but in our world, it's like, yeah, oh, come right. on, right? <laughs> yeah, right. So I would rather run the black market out of business yeah. and encourage the, uh, the marketplace uh, to, to host these facilities if we're going to have them. Because the black market marijuana or cannabis that's being sold is not tested. At least if you go to a uh, store or dispensary. a dispensary, whatever yeah. you want to call it, and you buy it over the counter, you know we've tested it. And it, it doesn't have any impurities in it. It's exactly percentage of what it says it is. Um, so I have, I have concerns about that. I want to put those folks out of business. Right now they're, right. they're you know, cheaper. So they're undercutting our, our uh, legal sales and right. that's, uh, recreational sales are a problem. So, but we got to get through the year and then we'll make an evaluation going into the next session. And if I have a recommendation, the legislative leadership has been great about saying, hey, Mark, if you've got something or you're concerned about something, tell us. Tell us. Yeah, right. And, you know, and they may opt not to do anything about it or they may. Um, so that's just probably, I think we leave the local tax in there because I think that's the incentive for communities to host a dispensary, mm -hmm. but we got to go back and look at the other two pieces of that three-step process. Absolutely, and I'm sure that the local economy gets a tax break if they if they host a local. They do. Dispensary. Well, I mean, they, they get they get a piece of the sales oh, okay. of the of the sales, so that's nice. And um, on top of the sales tax, so you have an excise tax, a sales tax, and then you have our local tax. Um, and some communities, you know, again, notwithstanding whether or not you like the idea of selling cannabis mm -hmm. recreationally or not, right. there are communities in Massachusetts that have embraced this. I mean, if you go and take a ride up to Great Barrington and the Northwest Hills, mm -hmm. um, they have uh, cannabis shops all over the place. Oh, absolutely. And it's, and it's a very expensive community yeah. to live in. Um, and so they've embraced it. They made sort of a destination. Other places, not so much. So it just depends on what the community flavor is and what they want to do. But um, I think there's opportunity there for cities and towns. Right. Um, and in, some of the ones in, in Boston, Mass, I visited one. They took an old bank in a, a decrepit neighborhood and just blew it open. And it, <laughs> sure. it looks beautiful. I mean, you know, and the lines are down, right? So, you know, right. we have one in Danbury. I happen to drive by it every now and then. It's not busy, crazy like it was when it was a novelty and it first opened. Right. So, I mean, you know, cannabis is sort of like wine in some ways. You have those people that are really into it know all about the different buds right. and seeds. And then you have other people that are just a casual user. If it's there, it's there, it's not, it's not. And then finally, this, we're struggling with having the edibles available, right? Yes. So what they do well in mass, because their, their uh, yep. cannabis uh, business is uh, a little more mature, is they have the seltzers, and they have uh, gummies, and they have all that stuff, even the cream for your muscles and stuff right. like that. We don't have that. No. Um, yeah, and so because everything sold in Connecticut has to be grown and made in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. I just visited a, uh, a facility, a factory that makes this stuff. Oh, they have a bakery in the middle of the factory to grow the brownies and the cookies, or to, I mean to bake them. And really? there's people with like chef's outfits on walking around, <laughs> and that's what they do. They make oh, cannabis no. brownies. Right. And package them, and off they go with a little sticker on them. Exactly. Saying that they've been tested. Exactly. <laughs> it right. is interesting. All right. Would you mind sticking around for another segment? No, no problem. I, I will say I was yep. in a very good mood when I left the cannabis factory. So I you know. will talk about that coming back. We'll be right back. <laughs> The latest social media scam is yet another phishing scheme designed to scare Facebook users into sharing their login credentials. You receive an email that appears to come from Facebook and says your page has been disabled for violating Facebook terms. If you believe the decision is incorrect, you can request a review and file an appeal at the link below. Well, the message may also state that if you don't act in the next 24 hours, 
Facebook will delete your account permanently. The email includes a link that appears to lead to Facebook.com. However, if you hover over the link, you'll discover that it doesn't point to Facebook's website. If you click the link, you'll likely be taken to an official looking page and prompted to complete a form and confirm your password, giving scammers all the information they need to hack your account. Instead, what you should do is log into your Facebook account directly to verify there's a problem. Never enter your login login information on a third-party website. And remember, scammers love to target social media accounts, so fake alerts are not uncommon. You can read more about phishing scams at BBB.org. Welcome back to this week's edition of the Pete Mazzetti Show. I'm Pete Mazzetti sitting here with Mark, Commissioner Mark Batten. Commissioner Batten, welcome back. Thanks. I think when we left, we were talking about how I left the Cannabis growing factory in a good mood. Yes. Right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Make sure. <laughs> yes. All right. Not my thing. No. I don't, I don't judge. No, of course right. not. Okay. But you just want to make sure we put put that fact. If we're going to do it, we got to do it right. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So, the second part of your job, working with the governor, hmm. and working with the the executive team, shall we say? Everybody sounds like everybody's very. Yeah. Very nice, very hospitable. Everybody gets along great. I mean, there's not, you know, like anything, um, I came in, a, I'm a Republican. Yes. And I work for a Democrat, so that raised some eyebrows. Oh, and, yeah, and yeah. people weren't really, I don't know if I can trust this guy, I don't know. But I think as, as I become more and more embedded in the administration, people have become more comfortable mm -hmm. that I'm there to do the right thing for the residents and to support uh, the guy who I think is the best for the job, Governor Ned, Ned Lamont. So. Right. Uh, yep, yeah, full disclosure, we are friends. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been friends for a long time. Um, it's a pleasure to work for him. He's a great boss. Um, he doesn't micromanage you, but he does want to know if something doesn't go right. He, w he will be on the phone with you right away okay. to find out what the heck happened and, and how are we going to fix it. Exactly. Um, so he's very proactive, and, and uh, he doesn't really like, he doesn't like reactive. He likes proactive stuff. So, you, you know, if you go with him with a problem, you better have a solution. Exactly. You go to see him, which is typically what we do. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's just been a great experience working for him and ultimately serving the taxpayers of the state of Connecticut. That's really what I do. So he's given me that ability to do that in a different way, and, and I'm very grateful. Absolutely. Um, now, as far as right now when we're taping this, the Connecticut State Legislature is in session. Hopefully they're going to finish up the legislative session. What Mid midnight Wednesday night. Midnight Wednesday night. What do you think? Is it, is it going to be? Yeah, I think, I think they'll be on time. You know, I was in the legislature for two terms as yes. a state representative and so familiar with the process and in fact some of the people are still there. Um, that was back in 1998. So uh, anyways, um, uh, we're going to finish on time. Uh, times have changed though. We used to have a big party from midnight to 6 a.m. <laughs> after the session's over. Obviously there's been a lot of stuff going on uh, yeah. uh, and so I think that probably will be very muted as it should be. Uh, no party at 6 a.m.? I don't see you'll see that anymore. <laughs> Those are the old days. Oh yeah. Um, so things that, you know, uh, people have, have looked at things a little bit differently and I think in a good way. Yeah. Um, so they'll pack up at about 12 o'clock actually. It used to be the governor comes out and gives an address. Yes. And sort of, you know, ticks through all the accomplishments, things that happened, things that didn't happen. Yep. And what the budget does. I'm, I, I talked to the governor this morning. I'm not sure if he's going to do that or not. It, okay. it, that tradition's kind of lost its way as prior to Governor Lamont, there were a lot of really rough battles mm -hmm. uh, between the two parties. And so, right. you know, the governor would say, I'm not going to go out and talk to him. Um, he may do that this time, particularly if there's a nice bipartisan vote on, in both houses with the budget. Um, but the, the lieutenant governor is the one that comes out yeah. along with the secretary of state and gavels a hammer and says, Session midnight, that's done. I've actually had to run a bill I was doing from the House up to the Senate at like 1145 <laughs> and talk to those guys and beg them and plead them to run the bill. You know, I didn't have a financial impact right. of something I wanted to do in Danbury and, and I got it done and I did that one year and it, and it really went through at like 1156. A, uh, and it PM. passed? And it passed. There you and, the, go. and I got the governor to sign it. So, All right. So it was pretty good. It's a crazy process. It, 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 is a, it seems like a crazy process. Yes. I've never been up there during the process, but I've been but, up there. Yeah. I've been, I've been up there, but I've, it's been a while because, as you know, one of my dear friends in the world was former Speaker Jimmy Amon. Yeah. Yeah. Love Jimmy. Oh. Good guy. Great guy. We still talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah so, so do we, and 
I'm sure you, I'm sure you remember Brian O'Connor. Absolutely. Uh, Brian, Brian's a dear friend. Brian was actually the state representative down here. Okay. He was there. I think he came in my second term. Yeah. 2000. He was there. He, what, he had five, ten, six terms. Six right? terms. Yeah, yeah. He's a okay. good guy. Now, and fun, funny enough, now he's working for Joe at CCM. He does. He does. In fact, he walked in. I go, I know that guy. And so <laughs> we, we hit it off immediately. But I always liked Brian, respected him. Oh, Brian's great. Um, thought he was a common sense person. And again, there for the right reasons. Oh, absolutely. Um, there, unfortunately, are always a few people that are there for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. but Brian is one of those guys that's there for the right reasons. Absolutely. So it definitely is chaotic. You got uh, yeah. to watch out for, for a couple of things. One is uh, bonsai amendments. So what happens is you would draft bonsai an amendment that okay. if you wanted to kill a bill, you would draw up an amendment that might be unpalatable to the majority party, mm -hmm. and you, you don't tell them that you have the amendment to the last second. And uh. so we would run the amendment down to the clerk of the, of the House. Yep. Of course, everybody would shout, they won't do it now, but they used to shout bonsai, but I don't think they would be appropriate now. No. Um, but uh, uh, they would then call the, I would, I would say, you know, uh, Representative Bouton from the 138th District, uh, the clerk has an amendment, LCO, blah, blah, blah. At this yep. time, I'd like to call that amendment and give an opportunity to, I still remember the verbiage, right? Yep. Give an opportunity to explain. And so the speaker would say, uh, Representative Bouton, go ahead. And I say, in your eye, you're having your hands, amendment does X, Y, and Z. Yep. And everybody would groan. <laughs> because they know now the debate of that amendment <laughs> right. will stall, the clock is ticking, exactly. and will stall other bills other that have bills. to come in. Right. So we used to do that, all, I used to do that all as an expert at, at killing bills that way, that were, we felt, our minority party at the time, felt weren't good for our state. Right. Um, that was just a legislative tactic that we used to use. And uh, um, then, you know, you would also have uh, uh, what they would, you know, strike all amendments, which mm -hmm. would basically, you might have... Uh, a bill that says, uh, you know, uh, a law to love all puppies. And right. like everybody's for that, you know, I'm for that. I mean, who's not for loving puppies? Right. And then somebody will get up and say, you know, the clerk has an amendment, LCO, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's a strike all amendment. So it take the language about loving all puppies, throws it away, right. and now inserts new language uh, that might uh, legalize cannabis. Yeah, right. Something Something <laughs> has nothing to do with the title right. of the bill. So the poor representatives like, would have to uh, vote against loving all puppies because the underlying language may be legalized cannabis and you weren't for that. Yeah, right. Right? So that's another tactic that used oh, to happen yeah. a lot to put what they call bad votes on your record. So now yeah. campaign comes around uh -huh. and, you know. You voted on this. You yeah, voted, you voted on against this. puppies. How could you vote? Well, that, you know, you have to sit there and explain. <laughs> well, it wasn't about puppies. It was about this. And yeah, right. So it's a, a funny place. But all that uh, stuff goes on um, from now till uh, midnight. Right. Uh, as, as people try to position and get stuff done. And then after... And then after midnight, it's all over until... It's done. I literally, papers go flying up in the air. <laughs> yeah. Because if you had a bill that you were waiting for the Senate to call or the House to call, yeah. it didn't it's pass. Dead. So now you've got to start next year all over again. You've got to go back to the committee and work your way all the way through. Um, it was kind of funny that way. And uh, they banged the gavel close. One year, somebody said, and I'm way off track of what I do, but it's kind of a funny story. That's okay. One year, uh, uh, one of the reps stood up and she declared which you can do at any time during session, sine die, which means close of session. And if you do that, you have to take a vote on that immediately. So it stops all uh, flow in the House, at least in the House it does. It stops yeah. all flow in the House. And we use Mesa's rules. We don't yeah. use Robert's rules. So she did it. And nobody ever, I never saw anybody do it before, but as a, a dare, she did it. Not funny. Oh, no. Stopped all of the stuff because we had, they had to go research what's the precedence <laughs> for this for about an hour. And then we oh, all had to no. vote against going out of session. Oh, God. Um, so that was the last time I ever saw that done. But that, people do do that. But somebody will stand up at midnight and declare an ADA, and they'll hit the gavel and that closes I'm sure that session. did not go over well. No, it, this is a good time. Look, if you have nothing to do Wednesday night at around midnight, yeah. it's open to the public. Go on up and look at it or watch it on TV. You can watch it on CTN. Watch it on CTN. And you can watch people, even the background on the TV, you can see people running around trying to, get their bill through at the last second. Exactly. It's, it's a great lesson in democracy. It is a great lesson and, in uh, democracy. Um, it still works. Look, it's, it has its faults. It's not transparent right. enough. There's not a public input, I believe, not a public hearings, all that stuff, but it still kind of works. Yeah. So it's, it's fun to watch. And the funny thing is about CTN, they cover everything. They cover judicial, they cover That's right. state. I actually saw you on CTN not long ago. Yeah, you mentioned to me that. You were, you were oh, standing yeah. behind the governor. I do that very well. Yeah, I saw um, I'm I, I very saw. good at keeping my mouth shut and standing behind the governor and just saying what he said. I saw that. Um, but, you know, I, I will say that um, many times uh, the governor has um, asked for advice from a whole 
group of people. I, I happen to be one of those people. Right. Um, and I try to be straight, honest, and forthright with them as to what I think is the best thing for the residents of our state. Mm -hmm. um, many, many times he takes it, sometimes he doesn't. That's the prerogative of being the chief elected official right. sitting in that executive office. But I'm also sympathetic to him because I know how it feels <laughs> you know what, on a small scale. For. And sometimes you got to weigh all these different things and try to make what's the best decision for the largest amount of people. So um, it's not always what you want, right? But at the end of the day, um, I find him to be a kind, compassionate, intelligent, hardworking man that just, you know, he doesn't take a paycheck. People don't even realize that. He works for free. And that man is everywhere. He is everywhere. I mean, he was, uh, I was with him all day yesterday. And he's you know, other places. You know where the only place he has not been? Out here? Mm-hmm. Oh, he'll be out. Oh, your show. Mm-hmm. Oh, we got to make that happen. Oh. Well. Yeah, we'll make that happen. He's, gonna, he's got a busy summer coming out. Yeah. We'll catch him in the fall. How's that? When they get ready to go back in session. Okay. Talk about his priorities. You think we can do that? Yeah, yeah. yeah we can do that. I'll beg him. Now, now tell, tell me this. As far as session goes, some years they have long session. Yeah. Some years they have short session. Right. What delegates the difference between long session year, short session year? Sure. The well, calendar? Yeah, well, basically, the, wow. uh, yeah. So the long, the the uh, short the long session years are on the odd year. Right. The short session years are on the, the even. even year. Gotcha. Um, and it, the long session goes from January to June, mm -hmm. and the short session goes February to May. Ah. So um, basically, the second year of your term as a, as a state rep or state senator is really your reelection re year. So they really don't so want to do a, short, a lot. That's a short They're session not take year. Anything country, that's a short session. Right. They're not going to take anything controversial on because remember, people, every vote you do is recorded. When I was in the legislature, yes. I didn't miss a single vote, no. not one. I made every single vote, um, which is kind of rare. Andrew Rohrbach did the same thing. If you remember, he ran for Congress. Yes. So, uh, anyways, you you just don't want to. You, you're paid to make decisions. That's the way I looked at it. So yeah. I would push the green button or the red button, doing exactly. what I thought was the best thing for our residents. But um, yeah, they don't want to do a lot in February to May. That's why, frankly, I think we have a biennium, biennial budget. Right? right. It's a two-year budget. Second year, they just make adjustments, mm -hmm. and you cannot propose a bill the second year if it has a fiscal impact. No. So you can only talk about things that are policy-driven, regulations, stuff like that. So it's kind of a slow year, but it gets a little. That can get a little crazy at the end too, but because people have to leave and they know they got to go out and run for re-election, and absolutely, and, it, and it's uh, hard work. Absolutely, Commissioner Bowen, we're out of time, but I want to thank you for coming down. Uh, I right. know. All right, I'm going to come back. Hopefully, we'll be the full city soon. All right, and one a year later from now. We'll no, you, no, you'll be back before then. All right. On behalf of Commissioner Mark Bowen, I'm Pete Mazzetti. Thanks, good night, and we'll see you next time.